You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Face, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, good afternoon and welcome to another round of Snarky Faith Radio. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney. Welcome back here to Snarky Faith for another week. And I hope everyone, I hope everyone out there survived Thanksgiving. If you're out in the Midwest, it was a little chilly. And if it's you were anywhere else in the country, the table conversation may have also been chilly. But hopefully, hopefully you made it through. Especially if you followed the snarky steps from last week to surviving Thanksgiving. And you know about me? You want to know about me? I asked you guys, anyone want to know about my Thanksgiving? Oh, my Thanksgiving was perfect. And it was perfect because of this one reason. Because during this time, you know, I'm a person who likes to plan for the future. And this Thanksgiving, my wife was a little under the weather. So I was able to go down into our bunker in the backyard. That's it's our fallout shelter so to speak, and I was able to retrieve our doomsday Thanksgiving buckets. Don't believe me? Well, listen, my good friend Jim tell you about how amazing, how amazing this is, how delicious it was when you're eating flavored gruel and beans. It was delicious, and it was all because of my dear, 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 dear friend Jim Baker. So, Jim, hey, Jim, go ahead and tell us about the deliciousness that I experienced during Thanksgiving. Side note, I'm completely full of crap right now, but you are listening to a show called Snarky Faith Radio, and that's just what we call a segue into being able to make fun of Jim Baker. So, my good friend Jim, Jim, what do you have to say? This is the most unique survival food. This is 52 servings. Jim's right here. 52 servings of deliciousness. You can just ask my kids because I made them watch me eat all 52 servings while they dined on some delicious saltine crackers. But there's always more. Isn't there more, Jim? Turkey feast, emergency food supply. That's right. And this food is 30 years shelf life. Oh, it even has pumpkin pie mousse. The for Lord dessert. is my shepherd. He's not he wrong. Know what I want. It does have a 30 year shelf life. My meal, my meal tasted like it only had a 10 year shelf life. It was that good. And when he says pumpkin pie mousse, he really just means it looked like someone took a dump on a plate and sprinkled a little pumpkin pie spice latte on top of it. Oh, oh, mwah. it was perfection. I mean, I would go as far to say that it was divine. In more ways than one. I mean, don't take it from me. Take it from random guy who's also on the Jim Baker show. Random guy? We made it the other day. It's, it's super delicious, actually. I love pumpkin pie. It has honey wheat rolls, green bean casserole, like a lot of you make, turkey gravy, seasoned stuffing, freeze-dried turkey, real turkey, mm-hmm. mashed potatoes. This... For your survival food, this is to have because even on Thanksgiving in a crisis, you're going to be able to have a Thanksgiving turkey dinner. Isn't that wild? And Jim, it is wild. It's wild because I never realized how much fun it was to eat food that looks like someone had already chewed it up for you. (laughs) It's amazing. It's like pre-digested. I mean... I felt like I was a baby bird and my mom had chewed it up, digested it a little bit and spit it back into my mouth. It was divine. That's the only word I have for it. So if anybody wants to have my same experience of eating food that pretty much looks the same coming in as it will going out, you should check up on Jim Baker shows, divine revelation survival buckets, because 
if you're in the end times, you might as well still, you might as well still be thankful for the good things that have happened to you in the post-apocalyptic world where holidays don't even matter anymore. But that's besides the point. And so we have exited, we have exited the Thanksgiving season. What? It went by so quick. And now we're into Christmas time. Oh, wonderful. And we here at Snarky Faith Show, that is all about the faith. We want to make sure that you guys are in the know. That you're absolutely in the know for everything that's happening during the war on Christmas. You didn't think it was yet time for the war on Christmas? <laughs> it's always the time for the war on Christmas. And I wanted to highlight this. This isn't necessarily officially the Christian Crazy of the Week, or it is. But either way, I just loved this. This is a list from a group called the Liberty Council. So first of all, you already know folks from the Liberty P Council are the ones you want to have at your parties. These folks know how to party. But Liberty Council started this, I want to say, a year, a few years back. And they published the naughty and nice retail list every year because it's important for Christians to know which companies recognize and celebrate Christmas, right? Right, because that's what we've all been asking ourselves. Like, I don't want to go into a store that doesn't tell me Merry Christmas. If they pull out that kind of like Happy Holidays BS, you know I'm going to go postal on them, right? But <laughs> this is so crazy, and I love it. Uh, so I'm going to read a couple excerpts from Liberty Council's Naughty or Nice list. You can find this online because we need this. We need this with us at all times, at all times. So a couple, a couple ones to note here. I love this one. So this year, Bath and Body Works, per their list, has made the nice list, which is really funny. I'm sorry. I'm going on a slight aside here. It's really, really funny that that Christians are obsessed with this idea of Merry Christmas, but really don't care about Jesus. Now, they would argue with that statement right off the bat. But, 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 when we look down the list of, of, of all of these retailers that have made niceness or naughtiness in the season, it's really just about saying the word Christmas. Like, that's the trigger word here that we're getting here. So, bat, sorry, I left you all hanging on the edge there. It was like a cliffhanger. Bath and Body Works, right? For all of you out there going like, oh, can we go or can we not go this year, Stuart? I need to know. Well, I'll read you directly off the naughty and nice list. Bath and Body Works, nice list. When navigating to the Bath and Body Works website, immediately shoppers are met with Christmas cheer, exclamation point. The website is decorated for Christmas and shoppers are encouraged to find out what Christmas smells like. You know what Christmas smells like? It smells like Jesus. That's what it smells like. A Middle Eastern man who spent most of his life in the desert wearing sandals and probably not showering that much because they didn't have showers. But yes, Bath and Body Works, all about Christmas because they want to know what does Christmas smell like? And they uh, go on here at the Liberty Council to to tell us this, they say, the company is clearly not afraid to say the word. Contact Bath and Body Works and let them know how much you appreciate their views on Christmas. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that we have a list that tells us where to go and where not to go? Now, I will note you this. Best Buys also made the nice list, and they said this about it. While Best Buys is not a department store and thus does not carry traditional Christmas decorations, they do have quite a selection of Christmas movies, and they also sell Christmas sheet music. Oh, my gosh. That's, they're basically worshiping. They're worshiping Jesus every day during the Christmas season, and this is just fantastic and there's so many other places that you can shop on here. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Now, we're going to have to get here. I know you didn't want to hear it, 
to the naughty list. <laughs> womp womp. There's some stores out there that apparently don't love the word Christmas. And vicariously, they hate Jesus. At least that's what the list here is telling us. So beware, beware of these evil atheist Soros loving folks out there. So here's the evil list. I'll just give you one snippet just to kind of give you a little flavor of what they're going for here. Thanks, Liberty Council. So brace yourselves. I know this was on everyone's list to go shopping here, the Burlington Coat Factory, because everyone wants to go to Burlington Coat Factory. I, I simply will not buy a coat unless it comes directly from a factory. And I, I need it in the title, because otherwise, I don't know where the coat came from. When people ask me, where'd you get that? I got it from Burlington Coat Factory. Thank you very much. And on the naughty list, here's what they had to say. Burlington has made the naughty list this year featuring quote unquote hot holiday deals. Hmm. This is my aside, not there. Hot deals. This sounds sinful. This sounds sinful. It sounds like the deals are not really being respected. Like we're, we're objectifying the deals here, calling them hot. Um, sorry, back to it. So yes, <laughs> they're on the naughty list this year featuring hot holiday deals and gift cards emphasizing happy holidays. Oh, the horror. In addition, they lack any emphasis on gift giving for the season and a severe lack of Christmas advertising with biblical meaning, whatever that means. Each ad or marketing concept starts with starts strong with Christmas themed products but loses meaning through emphasis on giving and receiving. Because we all know the nativity story about Jesus being born was all about giving and receiving. It was all about the gifts, all about the presents. So if you guys want to go find this, you can head on over to lc.org, to Liberty Council, and you can probably go through their website and find this if you really, if you want to. Actually, actually, here's what I'll do. I will throw up the link to this over on the Snarky Faith uh, Facebook page if people really want to go through this because, hey, 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 tis the season to be an informed culture warrior and a good shopper in the name of Jesus. Now, at this point in the show, you may be listening and asking yourself, Stuart, what? Why are you talking about the holidays? Where's my Christian crazy? And what the heck is the show about this week? Well, <laughs> I asked myself that same question just two seconds ago, which is why I'm transitioning to this right now. Yes, the show this week, which if you haven't been able to kind of pick up on so far, uh, we're going to be talking about selfishness. More specifically, how selfishness continues to push conservative evangelicals forward. It's like a shield that they use to continue to move forward, crushing and trampling people in their wake. It's their justification. It's their how they sleep at night. Now, they wouldn't tell you it's selfishness, but as we'll see today on the show, we're going to dive deep into the selfishness of evangelical Christianity. So first up, I promised you this, what, 30 seconds ago? And I'm going to deliver on this. So stepping into that, now you knowing what this show is about this week, we're going to go ahead and hop in to the Christian crazy of the week. What in the hot hell is wrong with you? What the hell is wrong with you people? So first up, first up, we've got Trump loving and host of True News TV, True, spelled T-R-U. So is it really still true if you're not having the whole word in there? Are they true? No, no, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> true News host, Rick Wiles. We've had Rick on the show before because, you know, when it comes to the Christian crazy, once you're already nuts, we always welcome you back. And, like, this last week, this last week... Uh, the government, the Trump administration actually tried to bury a new report on climate change and about the devastating <laughs> results that we are feeling and will continue to feel unless we change things. You know that thing? Yeah. So Rick had his own take, his own take on what the heck is going on here. And, you know, I know so many people out there when they say, yeah, 
tell me about this thing. Tell me about climate change. But I don't want to hear from those, you know, science guys that like study stuff and take measurements and go to school to learn how to do their job. No, no, we don't need them. <laughs> we need, we need ourselves a delicious ripe crackpot for the situation. So, speaking of crackpot, let's go, Rick. Let's go. We believe that China is well aware of the Ice Age, and that's why they're developing an artificial sun, they're developing artificial moons. And people here in the USA, you can laugh, mock, ridicule all you want. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on a second there. Hold on a second. Pump the brakes. Rick, what was this? Ice Age is coming? I thought that was just a series of children's films from yesteryear. No, no. What Rick is getting at here is the answer, the answer to what's happening with the climate, it's not man-made. We're just moving towards an ice age. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. We have no responsibility in anything that's going on, and Rick's going to tell us a little more about why it's going to be an ice age. An ice age. Hmm. So when we keep talking about global warming, that's bad. Ice age, ooh, sounds a little chilly. Sounds kind of cool. Rick, do tell me more, you cool cat. Yeah, you're going to end up freezing to death, all right, because this thing is here. It's, 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 it's arriving, and it's arriving quickly, <laughs> and it's arriving this year. We're going to see the onset of this uh, ice age in the winter of 2018, 2019, but it's really going to kick in next winter. That's, that's, that's going to be when you're going to have a lot more believers. So ice age, bad, but silver linings, lots more believers happening. Now I'm left wondering right now with the ice caps melting, hmm, melting ice caps, ice age does not compute. <laughs> it's just probably because I don't have the faith of Rick. Uh, but Rick is going to continue to give us more of that silver lining for the coming doom of the Ice Age. It will be amazing. Maybe. Some people said, well, why would God do this to us? Why would God allow it to happen? Well, God isn't allowing it to happen. All these things are happening as a result of man's sin. That man's sin, because we're connected with the earth, the, that sin is causing this disruption in the earth. The earth was never meant to uh, deal with sin. The earth was made perfect. The, the, you know, the Lord made it. The, remember, the Holy Spirit brooded over the waters, so He formed this earth. He made this earth for us, for habitation for us. It was our sin that cascaded that, this whole problem that we see in the world around so us. So the coming Ice Age that we're marching towards, I'm just trying to keep this straight in my head, the coming Ice Age is due to sin. So when we sin, the earth gets all sad and it wants to make us cold. Because I don't even understand. I'm sorry. I was trying to like tie this together and none of this makes any logical sense. This is crazy. This is like toxic, toxic Christianity that's going on here that, okay, as Christians, we know the one thing to blame, always sin, the Earth's kind of acting a little bit weird. It couldn't be, like, the things we're doing on the Earth, like, polluting it. No, 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 it's just, like, sin. Like, just sin that is causing this. Now, I will pull this part of it out. I will give them a tiny bit of credit because I do think that <laughs> issues of sin and selfishness are really at the heart of climate change and, and the warming patterns that we're seeing here. Now... I don't mean it's like, ooh, I said a curse word. Oh my gosh, is it getting colder now? Oh no. I looked at someone with lust in my eyes. Ooh, it's feeling chilly now. Did I do that? No, we are not Steve Urkel here in this situation. Man has caused this, so they kind of got that right, but it's the things that we are doing, how we are consuming things. 
how we are polluting things, the way that we are doing things, which in some tangential way, you can go ahead and cause sin for the sake of the show. I'm going to say it's about selfishness, and we'll get even more to that as we're going through here, which is our theme for the show today. But, but really, that sin is making the earth so sad, it's depressed, and it's feeling chilly. Hmm. But, but, but... See, these guys, these guys, I, they know how to do it. They bring you some bad news. They bring you the tough love that your sin is causing the earth to freeze. Even though we continue to hear that everything is getting hotter on the earth. And we continue to see these problems. <laughs> like physical problems, wildfires. Uh, the ocean's temperature is rising. We, you know, superstorms. we are seeing this happening. But no, 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 let's not talk about weather patterns. Let's talk about why this is going to be awesome. Why an ice age and millions of people dying will truly be awesome. And you realize I'm being sarcastic here, but they aren't. <laughs> so let's let them finish. And so when you see these things happening, it's the, it was the result of man's sin, not God's wrath. God will use it. Yes, because... It will freeze out Planned Parenthood. Yes. There won't be very many abortions in America uh, 15, 20 years from now. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of pornography consumption. There's not going to be a lot of drug use. I mean, it's going to freeze out a lot of sin. Yes. That's for sure, because people, um, a lot of people are going to be dead. And that's just a fact. An ice age wipes out a substantial portion of the population. That's a fact. That's a fact. That's also people that like to tell you about the good news of Jesus. It's no longer about saving you from hell. It's about saving you from an ice age. What? Like, what? 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 This makes my snarky brain hurt when I hear this stuff. Oh, silver linings to this? <laughs> well, you can't have an abortion when it's too cold. You can't do drugs. Can't look at porn because... Your balls will shrivel up because it's so cold, right? What I, what I, mm, like it, I feel like my brain is malfunctioning, like trying to piece together some sort of semblance of logic in what they're having here. All I can come away with this is these are hateful, bitter, nasty human beings. Or, 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 if we want to quote the movie Ice Age, take it away, Ray Romano. You're an embarrassment to nature. Do you know that? I'm sorry, what was that again, Ray? Can you please repeat yourself? But just to make sure everyone heard this, because I think this sounds more prophetic <laughs> than what we just listened to from Rick Wiles. You're an embarrassment to nature. Do you know that? Well put, animated Ray Romano there. And the last bit of Christian crazy, and it fits into our theme of just, ah, uh, the overwhelming stupidity and selfishness. Urgh of conservative Christianity comes this story. It, it hit the news before Thanksgiving. And I, my wife said, don't touch it. Don't even go after this one. But as I've seen folks on social media using the word martyr for his faith, we have this. An American preacher was killed by an isolated tribe after illegally traveling to a remote island. Yes, I don't even want to get too much into this because it's, ah, there's so much wrong in this story. And I mean, it ends up, when, when you continue to read more details about this, I feel like this ends up being like the, like the evangelical response to like the Tide Pod challenge that was going on to where we have, you have an American pastor that has been killed after illegally traveling to an isolated island in the Bay of Bengal off of India. Now, these islands off of India, they are restricted from anybody to go to. So they have, they have native tribes there. India has figured out the best way to deal with them is just to say, hey, nobody with boats, nobody around there is allowed to go anywhere near. But enter John Allen Chow, um, who is, was a preacher that intended on going and winning all the souls of these heathens there. So he hires and pays someone to take him most of the way there, 
Mind you, it's illegal to do this. And then the story unfolds as you would expect it to be. It goes on quoted like this. He was attacked by arrows, but continued walking. One source explained. The fishermen saw uh, the tribal's... It's not my quote. The tribal's uh, tying a rope around his neck and dragging his body. They were scared and fled, but returned the next morning to find his body on the seashore. And this, this kind of hubris, this kind of arrogance, this kind of selfishness has permeated and been, I would say, a cancer on Christianity for a number of years, this idea of being the white savior complex. You're going to go in to these areas without really much knowledge of the people, without learning from the people. No, 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 no. You're just going to go ahead in there because somehow God wants you to do this. Now, I'm not judging the guy's heart, which again, is why my wife warned me to stay away from this. But overall, I see this, and I wouldn't have even brought it up, but I just, when I begin to see people being like, oh, what a brave man. Oh, what a martyr for his faith. Oh, he's sitting at the feet of King Jesus right now. And I'm just like, no, this guy was stupid. This guy was stupid, he was arrogant, and he was selfish because he assumed he could go and fix these people. And, and this kind of thinking, this kind of thinking is what takes Christianity so far off the path of what Jesus intended. It's so far off the path of that. I mean, I continue to see folks, I continue to see Christian folks that I know getting into arguments and debates about what's going on about the U.S.'s southern border, about tear gassing families, and about making some sort of weird moral justifications for why all of this is okay. And I, I'm just, I'm just tired of it. And and it led me to kind of sit down and really just kind of contemplate on like, wh like what is what is the nature behind all of this? Like, what is the nature that even brought us Trump? See, I said it. I said it. I said his name. My last show, I tried to make sure I wouldn't say his name the whole time. And I danced around it. But yes, Trump. Why does the religious right love Trump? It simply put, they love power. They are selfish. And they've forgotten about Jesus. And so that led me to start digging in deeper about just the, the, the selfish nature, the inherent selfish nature of, of religion. And, and specifically Christianity and, and how it's led us to the place that we are, find ourselves in right now. Now, when I use the word selfish in Christianity, you would say like that should be like an oxymoron. If we look at the life and the teachings and the ways of Jesus, it, it should be obvious that selfishness, what, that has no place in Christianity, huh? How is that even part of the conversation? But the fact of the matter is, it is the central part of the conversation that we're having right now. And what was interesting was uh, I stumbled onto this over on uh, Raw Story, and the article is entitled, Here's How the Philosophers of Selfishness Came to Use Christianity as Their Cover Story by Amanda uh, Marcotte. Um, and, and when I found this, this was published recently, just before Thanksgiving, I think. And I was like, oh, this is a fascinating conversation. So I, I was trying to dig into like who the author was a little bit. And I found this. Um, I found that this article was actually originally published in 2013, which made me laugh because as I read through it, which I will read through more uh, <laughs> with you here on the show, um, I was going, oh my gosh, it's totally lining up the day. Wow. Wow. Right on. This word is right on with what we're dealing with in American Christianity today, but it was published back in 2013. So that just had to bring up that one little nugget of it, and it made me laugh. And uh, she begins her article talking about um, the nature of how <laughs> servers um, in restaurants hate taking uh, the shift where they'll have the Sunday crowds coming after church. And as I was reading through this, I was just laughing and nodding my head because I have had, like, one of my friends who's a few years back was a server in a town that I was working in, um, and I remember he, he, would, he would recount stories where he would see people. Um, and he said, actually, the conservatives were even worse. Like the, the Baptists uh, that, from the town that would come in were terrible. Uh, they, would, they would be very demanding. They would be very nasty. And they wouldn't tip. And if they would tip, a lot of times, especially the Baptists, what they like to do is they like to put in a tract uh, in place of a tip. Now, if you don't know what a tract is, uh, good for you because 
you've really not missed out on anything in life. But a tract is like a small piece of paper that somehow, in a trite way, goes on to describe how to find Jesus and why your life is sinful and bad, all in a little pamphlet. Oh, boy. So for people that were working, uh, making most likely less than minimum wage, uh, who rely on tips to be able to make a living wage, giving someone this is horrible and selfish, cheap, and again, has nothing to do with things like generosity and giving to others at all. So she began the article. I, it just, it brought me back to that place. Um, and because I remember he would, he would tell me this joke. He would say like, what's the difference between, it's, it's not a good joke, but it's, it's kind of a funny joke too. Um, you know, what's the difference between canoes tip sometime, whereas Christians Never tip. But um yeah. But actually that goes on to prove a major point um, of what we're getting at here. And in in the article um that we've been talking about here, I, I want to go ahead and quote some of this. Um she says this it's absolutely disgusting how the politicians who make the biggest show of how much they love Jesus would be the first in line to bash him if he returned with the message of clothing the naked and feeding the poor. Jesus of the Bible multiplied the loaves and fishes. His loudest followers these days gripe about feeding people and claiming it creates a culture of dependency. They may even comb through the Bible to take quotes out of context to justify their selfishness towards the poor, as Representative Stephen Fincher did when he claimed the Bible says, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. The fact that those jobs are unavailable uh, didn't give him a moment's pause when suggesting this very unchristlike plan um, to his fellow Americans. Uh, the article goes on to say this, that statistics bear out um, the sense that people who are more invested in being perceived as pious also embrace the most selfish policies. I want to read that again. Statistics bear out the sense that people who are more invested on being perceived as pious also embrace the most selfish policies. Self-identified conservatives and Republicans claim to go to church regularly, twice the rate of self-identified liberals. People who go to church more than once a week are far more conservative than those uh, than the rest of the population. Indeed, research suggests how often you report being in the pews is the most reliable factor of how you're going to vote. Now, what she's getting at here. One is that tie between uh, where you sit, uh, where you worship, and how you vote. But also, I loved it how, how she put this, that they are invested in being perceived as pious. They are invested in being perceived as pious. And the article finishes up by saying this, that the attempts to reconcile the correlation between displays of piety and support for having selfish policies get complex on the right, with cons conservatives often arguing that hating your neighbor at the voting booth doesn't count because church charities supposedly make up for it. But they don't. They don't. And what we begin to see here is there's kind of an inherent nature, which we're going to kind of dig into some of the roots of, of why this is. But this idea of feeling the need to seem pious and to appear pious, which, which, which is a behavior that it not only happens in churches, is almost stoked by the churches. So in many ways, we, we see in America is that, especially on the more conservative spectrum, is that churches are grooming people to act like they're pious, to act like they're holy. And when you learn to act like that, you also learn to judge like that. And you learn to be selfish like that because you think that you are chosen, that you are better than someone else. And that, and that right there is a very, very, very dangerous ethic to be able to have kind of imbued into the fabric of American Christianity. Now, I said earlier that that was the end of the article. I was wrong. The end of the article goes like this. Increasingly, the only thing religion has left to justify itself 
is that it provides cover for people who want to have bigoted, selfish beliefs, but want to believe they are good people anyways. As these social trends continue, we can expect the alignment between public piety and grotesquely selfish political beliefs to get worse, not better. Now again, we're talking about an article. That was written in 2013. Pre-Trump. If we can ever remember that there was a time before Trump and the rise of the religious right into power. Now, while I don't fully agree with her summary on that, I do think that in certain cases, I I do think that there is value um, to faith. There is value to religion. But the way we watch it walked out in America, that paradigm not so valuable and in that lens i agree with what she's saying so 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 you may ask yourself how do we get here how do we get here Stuart? well i have an article for you that we want to talk through here on the show and this is called and and uh the selfishness of salvation by frank fredericks and (laughs) when i was reading this I was going, yes, yes, yes. So what Mr. Fredericks has to say uh, was actually putting a lot of words to something that I felt for a long time, especially after working for an evangelistic organization for a number of years. Um, But I loved how he summed up. And what he's doing, he's putting through an argument within uh, to really challenge Christianity, American Christianity, evangelical Christianity, and, and their push for evangelism that the way that we have boiled down the gospel of Jesus to simply just being like, pray to accept Jesus and you go to heaven. There you go. If you don't, you go to hell. And, and the argument that he's making here, which I, I, th- I think he's, he's, he's onto something is that the way that we speak about faith and evangelism and the way that we boil it down into a sales pitch actually, actually lends itself towards this selfish outlook. Okay, so he says this. He says, something about the reward of salvation made the whole thing feel a bit self-centered. Salvation was at the center of Christian theology, I was taught. The single most important thing in life was my status as saved. The only other thing that mattered was convincing other people to adopt said saved status. And he goes on to talk about this and, and, and as he kind of digs deeper into this, and I found, I found it really interesting. As Christians, we're called to live a moral life, putting ethical standards above our own wants and needs. However, are we truly selfless in our actions if we're seeking a reward? If I help someone with no desire for return, then, that, then we would assume that that's moral. But if I help someone because I believe next year They'll give it back tenfold. That sounds like an inv- an investment. If we are only being honest, faithful, loyal, and humble for a pa- for the payment of an eternal mansion in the sky, then are we really being good people? If we allow salvation to be our true motive in living moral lives, then I can't see how we're not self serving in the process. So this idea: if you do this, you get this, in order to make God happy. So it's like this whole bait and switch thing that we've turned evangelical Christianity into. If you do this, you will get out of this and you will be rewarded. You see, the inherent nature of how you're, you're, you're packaging the gospel is a selfish one. Oh, you're sinful, but fear not. You can go to heaven if you accept Jesus. And if you go to heaven, oh my gosh, all of your wildest dreams will come true. But if you don't, it's going to suck. Now, that's kind of an odd way to encapsulate Christianity, but that is actually <laughs> that's actually the way evangelicals like to sum up their sales pitch for it. And what ends up happening is, you know, we end up hearing this, you, 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 you. And the only time we really hear us in the church is, is for you to be like us, like this collective Borg, you know, this step for wives situation. Where, where we're not really talking about the greater good of humanity or following after Jesus in order to help heal a world, not necessarily to put a notch in your about, oh, I've saved another person today. No, for people to be able to, to have a taste of heaven now. Like me helping someone 
with, well, me helping someone and expecting nothing in return, that's odd in this world. And that is a taste of heaven for people. But the sad thing is, I feel like the taste that most people have after dealing with a lot of evangelicals tastes a little more like hell than heaven. And C.S. Lewis puts it this way. Um, and he said this in The Power of Pain. He said, we are afraid that heaven is a bribe and that if we make it our goal, we shall no longer be disinterested. It is not so. Heaven offers nothing that a mercenary soul can desire. It is safe to tell the pure in heart that they shall see God, for only the pure in heart want to. There are rewards that do not sully motives. A man's love for a woman is not mercenary because he wants to marry her, nor his love for poetry mercenary because he wants to read it, nor his love of exercise less disinterested because he wants to run and leap and walk. Love, by its very nature, seeks to enjoy its object. And when we make Christianity all about ourselves, now it's easy to see this with what the Republicans have done um, and, and what the religious right and this weird bedfellows they've been working on for the past 50 years, really kind of ultimately coming to fruition under Trump. I mean, when you look at that, when you even just look at it, look at their king right now, so to speak, um, selfishness is, is probably one of the words that comes to mind first, besides just a bunch of knocks on his intelligence or lack thereof. But for Christianity to be able to return to its roots, we have to really begin to rethink this selfish thing. We have to really begin to think about how we've made Christianity all about me and not really about Jesus. Like, I've heard this countless times working for churches. Mm, you know... I just didn't feel the worship today. Mm, the sermon, mm, it, just, it just didn't speak to me. And when we hear that, you're kind of like, wait, wait, wait. Really? So you just came here for only you today? Because at least the way that we've structured our worship services, I'm going to church to worship God. But I didn't feel it today. It didn't give me what I want today. And see, the selfishness that we have within salvation, it's not salvation that's selfish. It's the way that we're packaging it. It's the way that we are uh, forming our ethical and moral standards. It's a way that how we vote, how we create lenses to view the world, how we interact with others, how we love or choose not to love others, how I see bunches of folks scoffing at families and women and children running from tear gas on the border and saying, good luck, you know, with what people are saying online. And it makes me sick because none of this is leading with love. None of this is leading with selflessness. None of this really costs anything of us. And when we make heaven the incentive for right living, are we really living right for the right reasons? I mean, the idea of, of following after Jesus, of embracing Christ's teachings, is really about <laughs> becoming a servant, which doesn't have a whole lot to do with power and doesn't have a whole lot to do with selfishness. Actually, it's kind of the opposite of all of that. The idea of being a servant that goes into places, that goes to help others, that that helps people because it's the right thing to do, not because it makes me feel good or not because I can tweet about it or Instagram pictures of me serving in a food kitchen about it. No, none of that is it. That's all lip service to the gospel. And the sad fact is that much of evangelical Christianity has become about lip service to the gospel. And not really about the gospel or following after Jesus. And this makes me sick. Because you've never heard anything like this in the show before, right? <laughs> right, right? So you may say to yourself, but Stuart, come on, these are all touchy-feely, emotional stuff like that. There's no science to back this, that Christians are inherently selfish, especially here in America. <laughs> then you'd be wrong. Now, our last little bit comes from this comes from an article called Religion Makes Children More Selfish. Um, and it appeared in Forbes, and it's by J.V. Chimeri. 
And and so he's quoting and and kind of digging into this study that was done um, and published in the Journal of Current Biology, where they actually did tests on children from around the world, over a thousand children. And they ended up, uh, so there was two different tests they ran. So one of them was they gave kids a bunch of stickers and they were supposed to be able to keep what they wanted for themselves and then give to others what was left over. And what they began to find was the fact is as they calculated, they called it a generosity score. They found that most kids that came from households that identified as Christian, Muslim, or religious, they didn't want to share their stickers. Now, the kids from the homes that would be regarded as secular, they shared more stickers. Now, you may say, Stuart, this world is not about sharing stickers. But they even did other tests within this with the kids. And so they wanted to be able to see their different views of justice uh, and had a moral sensitivity um, task. And so they actually showed kids videos of like something like some kid pushing another kid or bumping into them. And they asked for them, like, what would be like an appropriate response um, for this kind of behavior? Again, 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 uh, being very consistent with fundamentalism the religious kids saw actions strictly being based on right and wrong. There was no middle ground. There was no gray. So religious children in this study were shown to be less tolerant and they favored harsh penalties. So let that sink in your soul a little bit. So fine, 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 fine. You can say, oh, you're being too harsh on the church. <laughs> Let's look at the kids being raised in the church. Oh, 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 they're just a bunch of a-holes like their parents. Oh, my goodness. Oh, are they acting like Jesus? Nope. Or as Jonathan Kenneth Galbraith said, the modern conservative is engaged in one man's, a uh, one of man's oldest exercises in moral philosophy. That is the search for a superior moral justification for selfishness. I'm going to read that twice. The moral conservative, sorry, the modern conservative is engaged in one of man's oldest exercises in moral philosophy. That is the search for a superior moral justification for selfishness. I mean, we've heard it. It's even how we preach and we read the Bible. I mean, the one, the one thing, the one thing, this one scripture gets me because I see it everywhere and people want to name it and claim it. And it's really bad exegesis is really bad. I didn't say exegesis, exegesis, how you read scripture is really bad theology. And it goes like this. And tell me if you've heard this one. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, but plans to give you a hope and a future. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. I've heard that preached so many times. I've seen that on so many Facebook posts. Oh, the Lord has plans for me. If you read scripture correctly, God is speaking to a specific people at a specific time. You can't just henpeck through scripture and make it all about you, you selfish a-holes. And I say that in love. I actually do. But when we see things like that, when we see people grabbing scripture and using it way out of context just to make them feel warm and fuzzy, or it's a cute Instagram post with a beautiful background and it makes me feel more Christian, it's empty. It's an empty statement when you just pick out one line of scripture and you don't see the whole context of it. So I say all this. I say all this not to be bah humbug about this because I'm generally fairly bah humbug about the state of American Christianity on a regular basis, but I say this because it bothers me. This selfishness bothers me. It bothers me that it's like the hidden ethic of the American church. And it bothers me because of this. When we make everything egocentric, when we make everything about ourselves, all we can really see is ourselves. All we can feel is, oh, I'm uncomfortable. Oh, I didn't like that. Mm, it didn't make me feel warm and fuzzy. And when we get to that place, we're kind of useless as Christians. Not kind of, we are useless as Christians. Because what begins to happen is we, 
walk away from any idea of contemplation. We don't look around the world with open eyes and begin to say, where would Jesus be? What could I do to go be like Jesus in this situation? Does it mean going to an illegal island to a bunch of people that I'm not even really trained to reach out for or, or should even be here? No. Does it mean I need to sell a bunch of Thanksgiving buckets in order to be able to pad my own pockets while stoking fear? No. Does it mean that I need to blame the fake ice age coming on sin? No. See, what we lose the most here is I feel like we lose the sense of wonder and awe. The sense of wonder that as we walk out into the world that this is a vast and beautiful place, that the, that the environment is something that we should love um, as God's creation. We should fight for it. When we see people at the border getting hit with tear gas and treated like animals, that should bother us deep, deep, deep within our souls. If we say that we are... We are a follower of Jesus watching these images, seeing this on TV should infuriate us. It shouldn't make us think of politics. It should break our hearts. And much like they discovered in that, in that scientific study with kids, not everything is black and white in life. Like the older I've gotten, I've learned to embrace the messiness of the gray and in between. When you read scripture, it is not black and white. There's interpretations. There's different writing styles. There's different authors. There's different all of these things. And it cannot be boiled down to being something that easy because life isn't meant to be that easy. We live in a complicated world with complicated people. And we need to learn to be able to embrace things for what they are, not black and white, but stepping into those gray areas and see what is God doing in these places? Where can I be challenged to be better and to be more like Jesus? Where am I being a selfish consumer of religion? And when we get to that, it should make our souls cry out and long for something more, something greater, something more mysterious. Something that kind of requires a journey and following after and following through in these teachings of Jesus. Because at the end of the day, if you're following after Jesus, you should be wanting to make the world a better place, not making the world more like you. So in this season that's supposed to be devoted to Jesus, I'm not even saying <laughs> that's even biblically or historically correct. Jesus never said, thou shalt remember my birthday and buy presents for everyone but me. I'm joking. But if any of this Christmas season matters, if any of this Christmas season has any ounce to do with Jesus, we wouldn't care about naughty or nice lists. We would care about doing good and making this world a better place and helping people and going to those places that we know Jesus would go. I think Jesus would be down to the border helping people, comforting people, walking people through this. He wouldn't be standing back in a position of power saying, I have the moral authority to do this and... As a Christian, I think this is good. No, Jesus would weep. Jesus would cry. He would be broken for this. Just like we should be broken for this. There aren't easy political answers to this. If you're saying that you want to follow after the teachings of Jesus. Nope. It's just you needing to do the hard work. And hopefully you can do it with somebody else. Anybody with me for this Christmas season? Let's ditch a lot of this crap and really just try to go back to being decent, good humans that care about other people, that put other people before ourselves. I think that would be a Jesus-y Christmas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a big one right there. Well, thank you for journeying with me over this last hour here at Snarky Faith. And just a reminder, as we end this broadcast, you can catch us on podcast at www.snarkyfaith.com. And you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Or if you have questions, comments, you want to call me a heretic, go for it. Questions at snarkyfaith.com. I read them. I respond to them. But truly, 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 um, thank you for being here. In many ways, you are my weekly therapy. And, uh, and I appreciate all of you. So as we end this show, I send you off with the holiest amount 
of grace and peace and snark. Walk into this week with a sense of wonder that there are things that you don't know, but there's things that you can discover. There's people that you may have thought were a certain way, but they're going to be different. So be open to surprises. Be open to wonder. Be open to awe. And I'll catch you guys back here again next week. I am out of here. Peace. WCOM is listener-supported community radio, and Snarky Faith is only possible through our sponsors. Lumen, a spiritual community of seekers, sojourners, question askers, doubters, and skeptics, is a collective of fellow travelers that embrace the truth that all of life is sacred, hope is real, and tomorrow can be a better day than today. All are welcome. You can find more information at www.lumencommunities.com.